from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, all right. I think that you're ready for our next author because um, Ms. Agarditi has written a book called The Rooster Who Would Not Be Quiet. She was born in Havana, Cuba, and when she was still a kid, she moved with her family to the United States. Um, they moved here as refugees. They settled in Decatur, Georgia, which is where she lives today. Uh, Carmen grew up loving stories. In fact, um, she has said, I cannot remember a time when I did not love stories. One of her favorite books as a child was Charlotte's Web. And Kate DiCamillo talked about Charlotte's Web earlier today. That's a common theme. Um, because she has a deep love for animals. And her latest book combines that love for animals with her superb storytelling and a message of bravery and courage. Miss Didi will sign copies of her book from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Please allow me to introduce Miss Carmen Agra Didi. They're the ones that make us sound good. Thank you so much. Hola. That was kind of pitiful, people. Hola. Oh, and I grew up in the South, so it's hola, y'all. When I was a little girl, I came to the little town of Decatur, Georgia. And I know you all just heard that bit, but if you didn't, it was, well, it bears repeating. Because it was, as for many refugees and immigrants, uh, it can be a very interesting childhood. It's like when the Hmong refugee end up in, like, Wisconsin. Well, Cubans in Decatur, Georgia. When I was six years old, I started school. And I want to tell you just about that much about that experience. I remember my mother braiding my hair. And when I was done, ¿Por qué tengo que ir? Yo no quiero ir a la escuela. Why I gotta go no stink in school? I'm just fine right here. How are you gonna do stuff without me, huh? Because I was my mother's helper. And my mother said, Olvídate de eso. Tú no tienes que ayudarme a mí. You don't have to help me. You have to help yourself. You have to go to school. No me vuelvas loca. Needs no translation. And then we walked, we walked the block and a half down the broken uh, old uh, sidewalks, which every town had back then along a line of sweet poplars, and up the tired, well, they were stone steps, but they were worn. Other reluctant leather-soled shoes had preceded mine by many decades. When we walked in, we took a hard right. The old water fountain had the rust stain down the middle, black and white checkered linoleum, and there standing next to a door, this is the boring part, stay with me, was a <whistles> enormous door, there were <whistles> construction paper autumn leaves. The sentinel that stood by this door was a long woman, kind of gamey, hair sprayed into a perfect uh, football helmet. It was 1966. She was beautifully upholstered like a couch in ochre tweed. Kitten heels, Agnes Scott ring, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I would learn. And when she greeted us, she greeted us in those dulcet tones, so familiar in that time. Well, how are you, Miss Carmen? We're so glad you're here, precious. We, um, the whole class is going to learn about Cuba today. My mother looked at me. Ves, estás lista? You can't let me here? You don't even know this woman. My mother was mortified. I am so sorry. She let me talk to her for a moment, and then my mom pulled me over to that water fountain. Listen to me. I'm listening to you. Te portas bien, you behave yourself, and do not make the nice lady crazy. <laughs> which opened up a whole world of possibility. And then my mother squeezed my hands, and that's when I realized that her hands were as moist as my own. She kissed the top of my head and said, I will be back at three. You better. And then, as she walked away, she called back, I love you. I can tell. And she was gone. Click, 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 click. And I turned back. Don't worry, sugar, said my new teacher. You're going to love it here. I don't think so. This didn't look promising to me. I knew home. I knew my mother. I was a kid who was refugeed at three. I wasn't big on change. My new teacher back then, they didn't have ESL. They didn't prepare teachers for this sort of thing. 
Student and teacher, it was sink or swim, and there were a lot of drownings. She leaned low and said, Carmen, now prepare yourself. And that's when I figured I'd better stop this right now. Some of you children know sometimes you just have to get straightened out, you know, everything out from the get-go, as they say in the South. And I talked to my teacher and I said, wait, 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 lady, listen, listen. My name is not lady. You're not a lady? No, I am a lady, but my name is not lady. My name is Miss Burns. It was marvelous that she could get that much air in her mouth and it would synthesize in such a strange way. And I said, Miss Burns, no Burns. Burns, bur never mind. See, that's the problem right there. That's what I was trying to tell you. Carmen, we don't know. See, Miss Burns, my name is not Carmen. It's Carmen. <laughs> Those little penciled in eyebrows flew up like little apostrophes. She tried to run her fingers through her hair, but it had been like, you know, spray. It was like a helmet. And she shook herself for a moment as if to shake out the confusion. And then this marvelous woman took a deep breath worried her lip for a minute, leaned low. I could smell the evening in Paris. And she said, putting that Spanish name in her southern mouth, it's a true story, so I'm so sorry. Things are going to happen the way they happen. Carmen. You got hair in your nose. <laughs> she straightened up, I think I heard a garter snap, and she said, that's enough, Miss Carmen. My mama uses the little scissors. That's enough. I don't need to hear what your mother said. Come, give me your hand. She took my hand, this wonderful woman, and we walked into first grade with all the attendant sights and smells. There was a blackboard that was. There were enormous windows, and those windows had deep sills. They would soon hold little paper cups with seeds that would never, ever grow. There was a coat closet. There were chairs in tidy rows and there was an enormous ocean of a desk, and next to it, a little tiny desk. All the children watched. This is 1966, for those of you who know your history. They weren't sure what to do with us, so they sort of just let us wander in, and we, they'd figure out where to put us. The children looked at me. I looked at them. Can I go home now? Stop. Girls and boys, this is our new student. I told you about her today. Remember we talked about Cuba? We were late, of course, which is why the children had already learned about me before I'd arrived. And for those of you that are more politically correct than I am, I have to tell you, I love my people, but we tell time by a sundial. And so it was no surprise that by the time I arrived, an hour had passed, and all the children were expecting me. And when she had me introduce myself, my name is Carmen. I saw all their lips move. Now what do we do? Follow me. Go back to your work, please. I wrote on the board what I want you to copy. Continue your work. They all had Danelian paper. It was standard issue. It still is in a lot of schools. We went to her desk, and as she pointed to my new place in the classroom, I didn't like it. Children, sometimes you just have to speak up. Excuse me, excuse me, Miss Burns. What's wrong? How come I gotta sit over here? That's your desk for a while until you get used to class. Yeah, but how come all the other kids are sitting over there? I love codes. Well, darling, because you're special. That means I'm stupid. No, we don't use that word in first grade. Can we use it? No, we don't use it at all. Well, what do we, see, the kids are laughing, and y'all are like, oh, she said stupid. And look, the kids up here, they're like, oh, yeah. They love that word. It's a horrible word, but they love it. Sometimes they pick it up like a rock. I looked at my teacher and said, but it doesn't just... And then she just seemed so frustrated. She did everything but pearl clutch. And then she said two words, and girls and boys and big people. I mean, you're here, too, but you're sort of... Well, you're incidental to this story. She said... <clears throat> Overton Crooms! I thought she was cursing. And then a boy jumped up out of the front row, and he was a big kid. He'd seen first grade more than once. This boy had tenure. He had overalls on, his hair was slicked back. He had on a pair of work boots, and he kind of ambled over, and he said, yes, ma'am, Miss Burns. Please take this desk and put it in front of your own. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. He looked at me and went, <laughs> and I went, oh. <laughs> 
Oh, he's cute. He put the desk down. I sat down. Miss Burns started to speak. And as soon as she began to speak, I couldn't hear anything. Because phonemes for me were never clear. So remember Charlie Brown? <laughs> well, that's the way I heard language. I'm an audible dyslexic. It would be another, well, I was 28 before I was diagnosed. All I knew is I couldn't understand her. And meanwhile, next to my right ear, a voice had grown quite intimate. Hey, girl. What? Girl. Say your name again. What? Your name, fool. Say your name again. Got him in. I heard him. And I said, oh, yeah? Say your name again. And this boy goes, Overton Crumbs. Yeah, you laughing at me? I don't think so. <laughs> Rather than be offended, he did what you just did. He started to snort and laugh, and I looked over, and his shoulders were down on the desk, and he was jiggling up and down. And by now, guess whose attention we'd garnered? This is storytelling, the interactive art that is not rhetorical. Who is coming our way, do you suppose? Miss Burns! Oh, yes! Yes, with those long, stork-like legs, she is cutting it I mean, right across the classroom, and she is shouting, Miss Agra, Mr. Crooms, is there something you would like to share with the rest of the class? Now, you people know the answer to that, which is? You would not have survived in Ms. Burns' first grade, let me just tell you right now. But see, Overton knew because, like I said, he was a veteran in the first grade. He didn't say a word. What do I say? Oh, no, we're doing fine. You go back to doing whatever you was doing. I was airborne, gently, of course. She took me by the elbow, she marched me outside, she sat me in a little chair. How she knew, I don't know. It seemed to have just been waiting for me. And she said, you sit out here, you think about what you've done. Children, when I was a child, parents loved to say things like that to us. And you know when you've done something kind of rotten, but you really enjoyed it? They shouldn't tell you that. I sat in my chair and I began to sing because I was bored. And I'd just recently seen a movie about Cinderella in our black and white console. And so, in my Cuban accent, I sang, in my own little corner, in my... Inside the classroom, a voice said most sternly, no singing. <laughs> no humming. She was out there and on me in a tick. She lifted me out of that chair. She said, children, we're going outside, which is what they did when they didn't want to kill you. <laughs> and so she gathered up these first graders, and we tried to make a line, but we couldn't. We were a herd of cats. And so she finally, in some form of a herd, she got us outside. And we went out to the playground, which was an amazing thing back then, the playground. In Georgia, it was packed red Georgia clay that would kill a child. And on top of this, they put metal playground equipment. And on that equipment, the children played. And some of them didn't. It was Darwinian. If you survived the playground, you deserved to live, and your line would go on. If not, like the Carruthers, you went down on the monkey bars, and they never saw you again. <laughs> look, see, look at the kids, they're like, is that true? No, well. All the girls went this way, all the boys went that way, and I was by myself because I looked funny, I talked funny, and my mother dressed me funny. It's what happens to refugees. Don't feel sorry for me, my life turned out okay. Meanwhile, back in the story, hello, Tree. You are my friend, and I should call you Tree. Because, <laughs> right, like we make friends where we can. So, who sashays up? He was a sashayer from way back, Overton. It's a thing, sashay. He said, arms akimbo, great word, akimbo, right? Hope you're listening for these words. What you doing hugging that tree? You look like an idiot. <laughs> he was plain spoken. I said, it's my friend. Just stop that. Stop it. How come you ain't playing with them girls? Well, I wasn't about to tell him they didn't ask me, please. A little pride. I don't want to. Uh-huh. They didn't ask you, huh? You got nothing else to do, kid. And then he told me he was going to teach me something, and every kid on that playground was going to want to play with me. The girls, anyway. Oh, yeah, right. You got fairy dust? I got something better. Follow me. I followed him. Went around behind the sycamore tree and he said, put your hands up. And I said, whoa, he said, hold up, no. He didn't live in my neighborhood, clearly. And th th those are free. And he started to sing in dulcet southern tones. CC my playmate.
come out and play with me and bring your dollies three. Climb up my apple tree. Do you remember it? Slide down my, come on. Slide down my rain barrel onto my cellar floor and we'll be white jolly friends forevermore. More. Oh, man, it took about 20 times, but I learned it. See, see, my play. What are you doing? You don't dance. It's the way of my people, baby. <laughs> Finally, he just gave him and said, just go get them, get them. Well, I ran down there. I found those girls. I taught them. See, see, my playmate. And they played with one another. Hey, I could play with... I taught you. I marched right back. Hello, tree. What happened? I shrugged. He scratched the back of his head. Now, it hasn't occurred to me at this point, and it probably, uh, most likely, hasn't occurred to you as you hear this story to think why Overton isn't playing with the boys. Well, you see, the two border dwellers had found one another, and he said, want to go on the monkey bars? Monkey, hoo, hoo, hoo. no, no, you no soy mono, de eso nada, compadre. No, I don't even know what you just said. But come on, it's fun. Well, the monkey bars were on the far end of the playground, near the woods. There was another place to play. Half the time we didn't come back and they never looked for us. I know, I'm sorry children, you will never experience a feral childhood and I for one want to apologize to you for that. You all should clap. Do you remember feral childhood people? You come home when the street lights come on, we hoped you live. Well we're out there and we're swinging on the monkey bars and it's fabulous and I have like three minutes to close up so let me tell you what happened. We never heard the eternal call of teachers, right? Even back in the dark ages when the stones were soft kids, when I was a kid, that was how they called you. It was first day of school, I didn't know, and Overton didn't care, and so, Mr. Overton, Miss Common, now we're down to Miss First Names and Mr. First Names. We fell to the ground, I lost a shoe, I was digging around for it. She stood in front, towered really, casting a long shadow. Miss Common, did you hear me calling you? Well, I know what to say, y'all. I figured I'd just use a strategy that had worked for my mother before. I think you'll understand. I don't speak no English. <laughs> I thought I saw her laughing. She just bit down on her tongue. She, move, move. And she gave me a little shove, none too gentle. And as I walked away, ran really, I heard over my shoulder, so wonderful. And you, Mr. Overton, what is your excuse? And that precious boy said, I don't speak no English neither. <laughs> and there were two little chairs outside Miss Burns' classroom that afternoon. It was wonderful. I even taught him in my own little corner in my own. Why am I telling you this story? Because it's a story. It's just a story about voice. The irrepressible, exhausting voices children can have. The voice all of us in this room once had. The ones many of us buried long ago. And in the name of civilization, I'm all for it. We wouldn't have the grand buildings, the laws, the civility. But there's something else that comes with voice. Do you remember when it was strong and true? Who would you be if you hadn't become the person everyone around you eventually believed you were? What would you speak? What would you dream? My new book, The Rooster Who Would Not Be Quiet, is about a little village who, for reasons that seemed practical, outlawed singing. It became very quiet until a noisy little rooster who knew nothing of their laws, as most children don't when they first arrive into our civilized society. He began to sing, gee gee and he never lost his voice. So here's the thing. If you have it, keep it. If you lost it, be of strong heart. It's never gone. It's still in there. And to say goodbye, please say with me on the count of three, kikiriki, Spanish onomatopoeia for cock a doodle doo. One, two, three. Kikiriki! Check out my new book. I won't tell you the end, but children, the rooster turns out all right in the end. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.